spent a whole year at every time, I, every chance I could get to go to the anatomy department or the post-mortem department to work out exactly how a procedure had to be done and done safely and would accomplish the goal. So that meant we had to divide the, this, this bone. Now Galen, many years ago, gave the name to many bones. For example, he called the whole, the whole pelvis uh, he, he, called, he called that the pelvis, which is Latin for a basin, because it looks a bit like a basin. He called this socket uh, the uh, acetabulum, which meant a, an acetic acid cup, and that's what they used to have put in uh, cups in, that held acetic acid. But when he looked at, at half of the bone, it didn't, it didn't make any sense. He didn't know what to call it. It didn't look like anything. So he called it in Latin, Asa nominatum, which means a no-name bone. So when we developed this operation, which meant dividing that bone, and that had never been done before. People thought that was a bit too risky, but I never did feel it was risky. But uh, <clears throat> when we divided it that way, we learned the idea way to change the direction. And we called the operation a nominate osteotomy. Now, other people call it by my name, but that's, that's another story. But uh, in fact, for many years, I was only 32 when I developed the operation, and for many years afterwards, when I was traveling, someone would be introduced to me and they would say, well, here in Brazil or, or here in, in uh, Johannesburg or wherever, we just want you to know we do the operation on the hip that was designed by your father. <laughs> but the operation uh, uh, seemed to us to be ideal. Once we had worked out the details of how to do it, we take a bone graft from the top, put it in the center, and the, the operation has been done on this model of the pelvis. And that's a triangular shaped bone graft. So that what that meant was that the, the direction of the socket was different from the other side. And you could put this hip in the joint, you could rotate it back and forth this way, take it out, take it in this way, extend it down like that, and it would stay in the joint. So that, by deduction then, if we repaired the capsule, that is the soft tissue around the joint, put it in and did this osteotomy, we could, osteotomy means just division of the bone, we could then let the child walk again in six weeks rather than being a cast for a year. And so this, this had a major impact on, uh, on the treatment of congenital case in the hip. Let me take you back to the days when you were doing that research. Uh, did it develop as smoothly as you've just explained it, or were there false starts and uh, complications that you didn't foresee? Well, there weren't any false starts or complications in, in using it for patients, because we'd worked all that out in the, in the post-mortem room and in the anatomy department beforehand. And I've always told the residents, so if you develop something that's new and it has, has not been done before for patients, that you should really study it in the post-mortem room with humans in the anatomy department before doing it, and as I always have said, for a patient, for a child, not on a child, not to a child, but for a child. Did you do the operation on animals as well? No, we First. didn't do it on animals, and the reason we didn't, initially at least, was that the pelvis in an animal is, is, is not in this plane, it's like that. So the direction of the socket is really quite different. Quadrupeds, uh, those are on their four limbs, have their hips flexed, and their hips tend not to dislocate. In fact, only a few species, such as the Rhodesian Ridgeback and some of the German Shepherd dogs, have trouble with dysplasia of the hip, but very seldom dislocation. So that's why we didn't. Now, subsequently, a friend of mine who was, a, was one of the leading veterinarians in the United States modified the operation with my help, actually, for quadrupeds to do it in quadrupeds. So now veterinarians can do it. Yeah, veterinarians can do it, but they do, they do that version of it. But as I say, other people around the world call this the Salter operation, but I've never called it that. I've always called it the anomaly osteotomy. Mm -hmm. No name, uh, no, no fame operation. But so uh, this was a case, though, where you found, found the limits of animal research in orthopedics because the animals simply aren't that close enough to the humans. That's correct. But we, mm -hmm. that's why we worked it out in the anatomy department and in the, in the postmortem room. It's so important to, uh, to do that. When do you remember the occasion of, your first, uh, of the first time you operated on a human? Yeah, I do. I remember it very well. And it was uh, on December the 7th. 
of uh, 1957. I was I was 32 years old at the time, and, and uh, it was a very exciting, very exciting day. I I um, told the family that I was going to do something that was different. I showed them as best I could what we were going to do. I said the treatment available up to this time is not very satisfactory for this condition, and we think on the basis of what we've done so far with our research in the in the anatomy department and so on. We think what we've done there um, indicate that this operation is going to be much more effective than anything that was done before. And this particular set of patients uh, respected me and they respected that I took a lot of time explaining to them what it was all about. And we did the operation, but I remember it uh, very well and it went very smoothly. Who was the patient or what was the age of the patient? The patient was at that time four years of age. and. Uh, it, it was very, very gratifying. And when we took x-rays at the end, we could see that the, the socket, which had looked like that compared to this, now looked like that. And the two sockets looked exactly the same in the x-ray film. And I can recall showing, showing these to Dr. Mustard, who was such a brilliant man. And he said, I think that's great. Now, some of my other colleagues thought, well, that sounds like you know, a pretty big surgery for a small child. But just at that time, it the x-rays themselves couldn't have been conclusive. The real, uh, the real test must have been in the weeks and months after as the patient walked. Exactly, yes, and the healing of the bone graft. The bone graft is kept in place by this wire, sometimes two wires that grow across to keep it from, from being displaced. And when we've sewn up the soft tissues around the joint, we, we put a cast on. In older patients uh, in whom we're not going to open the joint, these are what we call subluxated, which means less than dislocated, just sliding a little bit, then we, then we don't use a cast at all. But uh, the encouraging thing to us was not only the x-ray appearance immediately, but also that these children uh, could come out of their, their hip cast uh, after six weeks and start walking right away. And their joints were not stiff, and they walk without without a limp after the first few weeks when their muscles start to pick up again in strength. And uh, the, the clinical results, that is the way they walked and the way they moved their hips and so on, were so much better than anything we'd used before that we were very encouraged. Mm -hmm.